So I have a few topics here today. There's like the northbound interface, there's about Yang, there's authentication and authorization. And then there's a few kind of future topics like expat and leaf refs and things like that. So yeah, let's get started. Um, so uh, Thomas had planned to talk about the refactored model plugins um, oh, and yes. of this, um, but uh, you maybe he'll just have to schedule another meeting for those, I think. Sure. I'm not going to try and cover uh, it. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, honest config on the uh, Northbound interface, obviously there's a few different formats and uh, so there's GNMI is the, uh, the public um, interface. Uh, there's uh, a JSON tree is an intermediate format, which I'll talk a little bit about as well, that's used in validation. There's uh, the internal data storage format that's used with network changes and device changes, soon to be transactions and whatever. Uh, there's GNMI on the southbound, um, and then we have to deal with multiple targets, which we were formerly calling devices, uh, multiple Yang models and multiple versions of those Yang models. So that's kind of the level of variability and variation inside Onus config. So this particular set of slides is really going to cover the Northbound interface and that internal storage format and talk about the, the JSON. So this one really is about how GNMI set works. Uh, so from the very top, you, you start with a GNMI uh, set. So GNMI is pretty simple. It's got like three methods, uh, uh, get, set, and subscribe. And, uh, and, and then what's passed in is, is this format that's defined through uh, protobuf, but it's really pretty elemental. It's like um, paths and elements and uh, and values, you know, so it's a generic kind of a schema for specifying configuration. So, so what we do is, um, you know, when we get in that GNMI, uh, we break it up into two groups, the updates and deletes. And so you can have an update of many devices uh, in one GNMI call and deletes in the same call. So um, what we do, we form a map of, uh, of the, target, which is device, to paths and values, and then we form another map of targets to just paths, because if you're deleting it, you don't need the value, obviously. And so from this, we form a device change, which is basically, so it's, it's a list of changes per target, right? So there's going to be a device change for, for each device that was changed in that GNMI set. So it's, it's a list of updates and deletes. And what we do is to validate that, we do a little bit of a, a layering. So we layer the new uh, device change on top of any previous completed device changes. And we layer on th that on top of the device snapshot. So if device changes had previously been compacted down, that's a device snapshot. So, and there might have been some device changes went on since that change. And so basically we layer all of these on top of each other. So there might be a combination of uh, a leaf might have got overwritten, uh, a new list might have been created. So say for instance, like in device simulator, we have like interfaces. So a new interface might have been added and there might be a whole new tree of leaves beneath that. And, uh, and then there might even have been a delete of an old interface and that should mask off the whole interface tree below it. But like we're holding all of those individually in every device change. So we, we layer and consolidate this and we produce a JSON tree. Uh, and we do this on a per target basis. And then we pass that to the model plugin. And previously we've gone in there and YGOT has generated a struct model for us with all of the validation rules. So a validation rule might be that, um, you know, a list can only have between four and eight entries or a string might be need to be between one and 50 characters long or something like that. And, you know, it takes the JSON, it, unmarshals it back into, uh, into ghost structs, and then it runs the rules over those ghost structs that it had generated from YGOT. 
and, uh, and and basically you get your response back yay or nay and if if the uh, if there is an error in validation then it passes that error of validation all the way back up through the gnmi and gives you a a, a, a set response that is an error and you'll see why it didn't meet validation um so if if the uh, question, mm. all of these happens in honest config in non in the rock api or the all of this is in honest config yeah yeah and that that validation happens in honest config just curious so it, if we get the data through gnmi they are in a rock above format yes why do we convert them to JSON to then convert them back to Go? Why don't we go directly to the Go track that are generated by uh, Why God? Um, <clears throat> because we don't want to have a dependency on those Go structs inside okay. the mouse config. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So you get your answer back from the JSON tree, yay or nay, and and if it is. Uh, then we take that device change and we write it to the device change store. And then we build up the transaction, which we formally call network change. And the network change then, uh, it's actually, as Jordan was saying yesterday, I mean, or the other day, um, we have a duplication. So effectively the whole change log is in the device change and it's also in the network change. Uh, so they're going to reduce that now to only have this log in the network change. Uh, so basically, from that point on, once it goes into the network change, then it goes on to the controller. Uh, it gets, um, uh, 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 and it'll continue to reconcile until that network change is pushed down to the device. Um, and, you know, I'm not covering from that point on because that's already been covered by Jordan. Uh, so that was the that was the set um, for the get. It looks like this. Uh, so we we start out, and the get is basically I, I, I didn't show it here, but basically the, we're 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 asking for a specific subset of the configuration, uh, and and basically. What happens is uh, we're asking for particular devices and we're asking for particular maybe interfaces or you know uh, lead, particular leafs or something like this. Um, but what happens is uh, again the layering is done in real time, right? So basically we take the prior device changes and we take the device snapshot, we layer them on top of each other and we produce a full JSON tree per target. And what we do is uh, we we push that into, what we do is we, oh yeah, we, we look to the get request and it has, if security is enabled, it has metadata attached to the gRPC call of the get request. Uh, we extract the groups from this and then we merge together the full JSON tree and the groups and we push them across to the open policy agent. And the open policy agent basically has these Rego rules. And what it'll do is uh, it'll say which configuration is allowed for you as a user, right? So um, for instance, you might only have the ability to see, say you're, I don't know, a Menlo uh, ONF user or something like this, then you can't see other enterprises in the Ether rock, you know? So basically it's, it's giving you back a subset of that JSON that has been filtered to your rights. And I know like from the, the honest umbrella, you haven't used this security, but I mean, what I'm kind of pointing out is that this is something to be aware of, you know, when you're refactoring honest config that there is this security feature mm -hmm. in there and, and, and this is how it works. Um, so you get back the allowed JSON per tree and, and then the filter with which you called in the first place is applied to that and it's replayed back out into proto format again. Um, and it might be for multiple targets, uh, you know, so basically the allowed JSON per target is all welded back together again and you get the proto format out um, with multiple targets that you asked for. Okay, so that was the the GNMI get with security added on. Okay. 
And this, uh, so this open policy agent is a sidecar, right? Which yeah. Those that are called. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're, and, and it's, we're making a REST call across to that. It's a REST interface they have. So open policy agent has these Rego rules, but the, 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 the end of the, the story is that open policy agent always only works on a JSON schema. Uh, so you have, to format, uh, you have to format everything into a JSON schema. You, get, you can get back a true-false answer, or you can get back a JSON answer, which is a subset, or you can get back a variety of things, you know, so based on the Rego rules that you write, you, you can define what you can return from it. Um, and I won't get into too much more detail on, on open policy agent, it's, it's a black box effectively. Um, so then, uh, just to talk a little bit about the network change, which we're calling transaction. No, uh, so there is, uh, it's, it's a key, key value store, right? So, so basically, it's, uh, there's a data entry per yang leaf, okay? So if you make, if you have a leaf, like, I don't know, that's showing the transmit power, or it's showing like, you know, the interface, um, I don't know, settings or something like this, each one of those is a leaf in the yang model. And I'll get into the yang modeling a little bit uh, in, the, in the next set of slides. But basically, um, for the internal storage, there, there will be a path, a typed value and then a flag saying whether this item was uh, a removed or not, whether it's a, a remove of this leaf or whether it was an, an addition of the leaf, right? So the path will have to correspond to the Yang model, right? Because um, uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, that's how validation works, you know. So, so basically, what we're doing is is it's it's flattening out um, the Yang model. So, for instance. We have container 1A, uh, list 4, and list 4 basically has a key. So this is L1 uh, in that list. And, uh, and then list 4A is another list within a list. And this is a double keyed list. Uh, and one of the keys is a string, and the other one is an integer. And the leaf at the end of the day is display name. So basically, that's the path that you're storing within that internal change. Um, and the, the value you're storing is a typed value, right? So, so on the northbound, you were getting in like a request and it was typed, but the GNMI types don't exactly match the Yang types all of the time. So GNMI, like for instance, has a float, uh, whereas Yang only has a decimal 64, you know? So uh, GNMI also has a decimal, uh, value. Um, so you've got to kind of, there isn't an exact match between the two of them. And also um, on the north bound, uh, your value is coming in and it might say unsigned integer or signed integer. But really within, within Onus config, um, we have to treat different integer sizes differently depending on some circumstances. So there's this RFC 7951 which says that if you are creating a JSON tree um, and you're dealing with a decimal 64 or a 64 bit uh, uint or, or int, it has to be in quotes uh, rather than just being like a, a number in the JSON. So that's why um, we can't just take the type value from the, the north bound what was sent in. We, you need an assist from the model plugin. And so that was, there's, that's the second place where the model plugins come in to use is when you start up the model plugin, you go get the set of uh, read only paths and you get the set of uh, read write paths. And basically you keep those and, and you look those up before you create the network change because uh, you, uh, you want to make the network change of the right type. You wanna, the type is gonna contain was it an integer? And basically, what size is this integer? 8 bit, 32 bit, 16, so on, like this. Okay. And, and with, say, decimal 64, you've got to keep the number of decimal places in there so that you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to extract it again in the right format. Um, and then, uh, whether the leaf is being removed in this or being added is the, the other, um, the other uh, flag that, that we're keeping on it. So, that was that was really what I have in terms of the internal storage format and the northbound interface uh, on this. I didn't get into the 
dispatcher on the southbound because I know that's going to be reshaped a lot. And, and also, I didn't get into um, how we deal with state because uh, as, as uh, I think Adib proposed that um, state should be done in a separate module altogether and, <clears throat> and that uh, it should be a separate microservice to deal with state from from targets, uh, so I didn't get into any of that either. Uh, Sean, a quick question here. So, uh, uh, perhaps I forgot. So, uh, this representation just <laughs> returned the leaf values. I mean, the from the root to the to the to the end of the tree, right? So, the leaf value, not just a subset of tree, right? Or we uh, return the. Uh, no, so there'll, there'll be, no, it's not just a subset. Uh, well, a network change, yeah, will have a subset. Um, so everyone that's changed in this network change will be represented here. W was that your question? No, no, I, I mean that, for example, if, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I send a GET request uh, on the root of the tree. So right. it returns a subtree, in the north one, I forgot, or oh. it doesn't return anything. Uh, it will return the whole tree. It it returned the whole tree. So be, because return. yesterday you you were discussing this, if we need to change the format to make it look like a tree or something like that. So do you right. want to discuss that, or do you, should we keep it as a flat list of past values? Uh, so I think yeah. as far as as far as we we can read if it is already returned a a stop a sub tree or a value or anything so we should it should be okay but if it doesn't if it just deal with the leaf values not the sub trees so probably we need to think about it because uh, yeah, if you would like the, to uh, yeah Go the, ahead. the query yeah. the query can from the get request can happen at any level i mean you could request a leaf you could request list for a here Okay. Um, you know, which would have many instances of list for a, and it would have many instances of its leaf and possibly other <clears throat> leaves as well. Um, you know, so uh, if you were sto storing the device change now as a as a full config in a JSON tree, um, you're going to have to drill into that tree to get exactly only those pieces that you were asked for, you know, that, that, that were asked for, like just the list 4A and not the ones above it. But the representation will have to come back and it might have, it might have container 1A and list 4L1 as the prefix, and then it might have the rest of it, you know, spelled out as individual uh, as, as individual leaves, um, you know, and each one would have their own elm in the GNMI get response. And, and of course, as well as that, you know, at the moment, like previously we used to only have JSON as the output format to represent multiple leaves together in the, uh, in the output, but now we have proto as well. So uh, you yeah. have a choice when you make the call, do you want to get it back in Proto or do you want to get it back in JSON? Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, th there's, um, there's a bit of variability there as well. So there is no need to change the current format. We can go no, forward no. with the current uh, format, yeah? Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think you're fine. Right. Okay. Okay. So in the next, unless there's any more questions, I was going to go on and talk a little bit about uh, the Yang kind of variability and, and how we approach modeling and some modeling and, and that's the thing is like different customers uh, that would use Onus config might take different approaches and and you know we talked to I think Juniper um, they were looking at using Onus config at one stage and they had a, an, an enormous model uh, yeah, it thousands was thousands of leaves. It's yeah. absolutely thousands of leaves. Like it was just a big dump of everything that Juniper had ever done, I think, over the past 10 years or something like this. And it was a huge model. And and you know, uh their style was, you know, they had one, I think I can't remember, it was like one top level container containing everything. It was like it, it kind of broke the rules <laughs> a bit. And 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 so I think. You know, they came, um, the authors of Yang came out with uh, 
RFC 8407 gives a kind of a best practice of how to uh, how to write your yang and not to be doing daft stuff with it. And, and in fact, uh, in, in uh, the config models now, we're using P yang lint and basically that lint is applying 8407 to, to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're following best practice. And, uh, and also things like ensuring hyphenated names and, and all of this kind of stuff. And sometimes it gives out a warning and, and we're turning that into an error now as well. So that, that you know, we're trying to create some limits on, on, on the Yang variability that's gonna come into it. Uh, Sean, is there a way to, like if somebody comes in and has a model that does not comply to these, uh, what do we do? Like, do we tell them to fix it? Uh, do we include it in ignoring the warnings? Uh, yeah, well, you see, the thing is you, you I suppose we can only advise it as a, as a best practice mm -hmm. and um, really, your yangs are held in a separate repo anyway. They're not okay. they're not in honest config. So say for instance, like in the Ether project, yep. we're keeping our yangs in our repo and it's up to us to lint them ourselves. Oh. So you know it's up to every company to lint them. But this is this is our advice, I think. Because so we want to have a thing is a suggestion, it's not being mandatory. mandatory. Yeah, and, and the you know the thing is is for instance, like double keyed lists were something that we found difficult to support inside Onus config. We know we have support for it in there, um, but uh, you know, uh, for instance, like if they go for triple or quadruple keyed lists or something like this, mm. you know, maybe I think we have support for it now. I haven't tried it, um, but uh, things like that, you know, and, and some kind of daft stuff that that like you know is like for instance. Does the open config models, um, uh, you know, they're kind of, I suppose, what YGOT is kind of built around and they've tested a lot of YGOT with those open config models and, you know, they're, they're saying, but there's a lot of different styles of, of Yang really out there. You know, we use in Ether, we use leaf refs a lot, whereas like in, in open config models, they hardly use leaf refs at all. Um, and and we use a lot of lists and and those kind of things. So I was just going to say that um, today, it's, I mean, those the open config models were written from the perspective of a device, and I think that's what Stratum did. Is Stratum basically copied the honest config models and extended them with their own, you know, leaves and 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 containers and all of this kind of thing, and and brought in various bits and pieces. Um, but like what I would say about devices is devices, their yang should match exactly what they do. And that was one of the problems with Stratum is that their yang like named things that the device couldn't actually support at all. So, you know, there were no guardrails there. You could set something and you get an error message back from the device. And, you know, it was uh, it was up to you to deal with it then. So you, you're you're network change might be left in a pending state because you got an error when you tried to push this config and there was no way back out of that, um, you know, other than to, I don't know, fail the, the network change or try rolling it back or something like this. So my philosophy on it is that the, the Yang should match exactly the device and you can use deviates and augments and all of those kind of things in Yang to, to make that the case. You remember we, with Stratum, we looked at doing a deviate and I know there was some problem when we tried to do that deviate. It wasn't supported. I think we put some by, of those. I think we put some of those in. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's still some because I'm not sure how much you can deviate. In the end, I, I yeah, yeah it was and quite some years ago. Deviates in the Yang language. I think that Ygot doesn't support fully either. You know, yep. so so Ygot is is kind of a, a limitation. But um, yeah, so you can define your Yang for configuration attributes and state are, are one only, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I think in, in Ether, we don't have any state. And, um, you know, I think from honest config perspective, now we're saying we're just going to ignore state, uh, any stateful attributes, because uh, they're just read only. The, the P Yang I covered, there is a registration of Yang prefixes, and it looks like about three years ago, uh, that time on, registered ONF as a Yang uh, registered prefix. And the linter actually checks that, uh, that basically you have a, you have a prefix on, on your Yang, so use ONF. There's all sorts of things with augments and, um, 
uh, deviates and submodules and there's various different styles of things you can do there. And that should be transparent enough to own as config because um, YGOT takes care of consolidating all of those for you, you know. So you don't deal with Yang models with Yang files individually. What you do is you assemble them into a model and then it's the consolidated model that layers deviations and augments on and sub modules on top of each other to have a consolidated model. Um, so what we try doing is in the test device models, we tried to have, uh, you know, every kind of variety of, of thing. And, and what I was going to show is just uh, quickly look at the, well, that's the ether one. Uh, let me see. This, this is test device. So say for instance here, this is the tree view. You can see like, you know, there's UN date, there's decimal 64, in 16 binary types. There are uh, double key lists. Um, there are identities, enumerations, uh, choices. Yeah, that's a choice. There's uh, leaf refs. Uh, and, and then test device one has some other things as well. So there, there's, a, there's a list four and the ID of list four has to be listed in a list to a name. So, you know, you can't specify an entry in this list four unless it's already present as, as a, a name in list two a And, you know, there's leaf refs and all of those kind of things come up all of the time. And, and here we have a read only state and and so on like this and so there's lots of the test cases and unit tests inside of uh, of honest config refer to a lot of these uh, modeling um trees as well you know so you you'd see those in the uh, in in the unit tests okay so in in ether yeah we've used uh, top level containers there are 10 top level containers and then we have lists of entities and these have sub lists beneath them and then we have leaf refs to other instances in other lists. And so I was just going to quickly uh, refer to that. So say, for instance, here we have um, we've connectivity service, right? And so that's not dependent on anything else, right? So that's the base kind of entity. So Scott designed this. We've got like 10 separate Yang files. So each one is its own module. Um, so Connectivity service, I think it's enterprise, refers to connectivity service. So when you create an enterprise like Ether ONF, uh, you say which connectivity service type it supports, maybe 4G core, maybe 5G core. Uh, and so there's a list of those, as you can see there with the, with the star icon. So yeah, if you take something like a device group, it's referring to a site, uh, and it's got a set of IMSIs and, you know, it's got, uh, it's got a link across to the IP domain and so on like this. So IP domain is its own top level entity as well. So that's, that's the kind of modeling style that's used in Ether. Just wanted to cover that. So YGOT is uh, Yang Go Tools. It's from the Open Config project and so basically it comes in it passes the yang and builds up a schema in uh in go um uh, and and so that's that schema is walkable there's like yang.entry is the the type of struct and it, it creates a kind of a linked list tree um that that you can navigate to navigate through the model but also it's creating a bunch of go structs then to uh to hold the actual values you know like 10 or l1 or, or, or those kind of things as well and um honest config uses uh ygot to basically extract the types like i was saying earlier we need to know whether it's a 64-bit int or a 32-bit int um uh it extracts the types from the schema when when it connects to the model plugin and then when validation happens the model plugin on marshall's the JSON into these Go structs and and basically validates it against the schema and so makes sure that like constraints like you know the maximum 
length of a string is between one and 50 characters and, and all of that kind of thing. Okay. So uh, Go Yang and Ygot, um, you know, uh, you could potentially, uh, what, what Go Yang, I suppose, is, is probably the lower level one. And, and Go Yang basically parses its elixir effectively for the Yang language, and it builds up a model. Um, and that model doesn't, not every aspect of that translates into Ygot, uh, only, only some of them. So say, for instance, like, um, you know, if you had uh, must rules were, were one that, that I looked on, you can write a must rule in Yang and the Go Yang takes it in and it parses it and it understands it, but Ygot just throws it away uh, and, and you, you can't get access to it inside your, your Ygot tree. So, um, you know, Ygot, the entry has less details than, than Go Yang, so not every entry is a first class citizen. Uh, and like, so for instance, deviate and must, they're added in as extra. So there's a kind of a catch all bucket where you, where you can get that, you know, and use it inside of Onus config. Uh, and to go, yeah, so there's a Go code generator that generates Go code out of that Go Yang. You could extend it, but basically, you know, you'd, you'd have to use your own, you'd be extending Ygot, which is not a simple thing to do. They're very fussy. I, I pushed a patch to Goyang, and it was a pretty sim simple one to basically be able to extract the most statements. And like there was eight weeks of toing and froing, oh, you know, and, and review. And, you know, that was just a pretty small change. So, you know, I, I, I kind of get the feeling if we want to do something complicated, we're probably going to have to do our own fork of it or something like this, and then try and push it upstream at some later date or something like Just that. Just never pleasant to maintain the fork and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I was just going to cover this one quickly um, because it is part of Ether and, and, you know, it is something that should be taken into account, I think, when, when you're refactoring Honest Config. Uh, authentication is done by um, uh, with gRPC by adding a bearer token to the metadata of the gRPC call. Okay, so it's it's like a HTTP. It's but it's added to the metadata rather than a, as a header. Um, so it's a bearer token. It's got bearer space and the and the token, and uh, and and what happens is once that token comes in in honest config. Um, verifies that the key is valid by checking it with the issuer. So Onus config needs to know who the issuer is and the URL to the issuer and the keys of the issuer are publicly available. Um, so that's no problem. The keys expire after six hours and if it's stale, Onus config must fetch it again. Uh, so there's, there's a loop in there that basically says, you know, validate this key, and if you get an error back saying the key has expired, then you go fetch the key again and you retry the, the validation. And uh, and so there's an environment variable for Onus config, uh, and it tells it the address of the issuer. Um, so, so the bearer token contains the username of the caller and the groups that the caller belongs to. And, um, and so when you do a, a GNMI set, the username is added into the network change and that gives you traceability because now you're able to see who made that network change and you will also know the time that they made it and so on like this. So it gives you that kind of audit level and, and that's where we get it from and that's necessary for Ether. And it's also, we, we do a trace statement in the logs to show who made the call to create the network change. Um, Authorization, uh, like I showed before, Open Policy Agent is there. It's a, a sidecar, and it's only operating on GNMI Git at the moment. Okay, so anyone can make any set, but obviously, if you don't know what's in the system, then you don't know really what to break in it. You know, so for the moment, it's there on the Git. When you run Ether GUI you only get the set of enterprises that you're supposed to see. You only get the set of slices and, you know, applications and all of those kind of things. So, uh, I, you know, I've, I've covered uh, most of that already. And I have a, I have a set of detailed slides uh, that I did previously that uh, dive into exactly, you know, the details of, um, 
you know how all the tokens work and and uh, key cloak and how it integrates and and all of that and i, I won't get into that uh, today uh, anyone can follow that one uh so yeah i was going to continue then um with some of the forward or the, the future kind of features that we wanted to add. So um, so from an ether perspective, there's a need to have uh, guardrails. Um, so basically this means uh, business rules for interleaf um, uh, kind of interlocks, you know, so for instance, like that, you know, uh, I shouldn't put the bandwidth above a certain level when I've chosen this particular type of device or something like this, you know. Um, so uh, Yang has uh, has a feature called must rules. And so basically, the must rules must be satisfied before validation uh, is true. OK, so uh, if, for instance, um, uh, and, and th sorry, the must rule must evaluate to a true or false condition. Um, so uh, they're written in expat, and expat is a query language um, for XML, and the older folks among us will <laughs> probably have suffered the, the pain of, of XML for a long time and, uh, and, and know what expat is all about. It's a very flexible language, and, um, you know, why did I choose expat? I didn't choose expat, expat. Yang standard references it directly, even though Yang itself does not employ XML, um, you know, but uh, the reason they use it is because Yang was used with NetConf first, which did employ XML, uh, as you know. Um, so really expat is primarily for defining must statements, and so it expresses binary conditions uh, that must evaluate to true for validation, and it can use functions like count or sum uh, can be used on, on elements or attributes of the Yang model. And, uh, and expat statements can be relative to a container uh, or, and, and works with lists and list, leaf refs, or oh, I should say leaf lists and, and leaf refs. Uh, so, you know, there's complete variety. So I was going to give an example of, of them in the, in the next slide, but uh, I just, just first I wanted to cover there is a library uh, in Go for parsing expat queries. And then what you must do is you must form your data into a, a node navigator. And so there's an interface uh, called node navigator in this expat project. And it has methods like move to child, move to next, move to parent, and it allows you navigate the tree. So say for instance, you put in the expat has some you know, path in it, like saying, I don't know, container 1A slash list four, you know, slash something else, something else like this. Uh, it, it allows us to move down through your model with uh, move to child, move to child, move to next, move to next, and so on like this. And, and each one of those methods returns a true or, or a false. So if you go move to child and there's nothing below it, then you get a false. Uh, but if, if there is, then you get a true, and now the context is, is the context of the child, and, and you can go move the parent to get back up to the parent one, and so on like this. So that's the, that's the navigator. So there was an XML node navigator, and there's a JSON node navigator, but uh, what I decided to do is um, let's use the YGAS structs with the Yang entry and create a Yang node navigator so that's something that i have started it's not completely finished yet uh, and one of the kind of um issues that i had to overcome is that the yang tree of yang entries uh really only deals with the yang definition the metadata if you will uh, and the values of um entries uh have to come from the goal struct so what i have is when you create a new node, Yang node navigator, I weld together the, the Yang metadata with the goal struct to form <laughs> one tree that you can navigate. And as you navigate up and down that tree, then you can do things like move to child, move to next, and get value. And, uh, and, and so 
you come in with your XPath, you compile it, and it tells you if you have any syntax errors in your XPath, and then you evaluate uh, you evaluate that against the node navigator, and it gives you back uh, a true or a false answer uh, for each one of the most statements in your Yang. And that's how you can tell whether you're valid and whether you're meeting the guardrails. Okay, so why do we do this? I think the, the reason I wanted to go down this way is because Yang already has this and this is a Yang feature, right? So I think it makes honest config richer to have it, you know, especially if you're talking about external companies, they might have their own Yang and they might have their own must rules. And so like, let's try and do it in the standardized way if we can, rather than having, introducing some other kind of business rules language or our language for defining business rules. Um, let's try and use what's in the, in the standard. Um, so, Last time I tried to introduce our business rule language, it didn't end well. Nope. No. <laughs> yeah, you were not here. I remember the presentation from the Indian uh, person. Sampan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fraught with difficulty. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so here you have a Yang model. It's defining most of the constraints you want. So, like, why not just put your extra constraints in a, a way that's understood by Yang. And, and P Yang can parse it and you know you get all the tool support as well and, and, uh, and that's a benefit as well. So, so here for instance is an example. Now, this is just some XML that I, I thought, you know, if the Yang model were XML, here's what it would look like, right? So, so basically it's the Yang model is not XML, but this is just, I, I use this to try and validate that the expat idea would work, right? So, um, and and I structure the Yang node navigator like this, so that if you if you had a top level object called Ether, and then beneath it you have the Ether container, and then you have the list or the application container, and you have the list of applications then beneath it. Each one has their own ID, which is defined by the Yang key. So this is. Starbucks and this one is Starbucks Fidelio. Um, and each one of those then has a, an element beneath it, which is like uh, leaves are elements and, and the value within it is a text node in the, in the you know, in the nomenclature of, of XML, it's a text node. And then the key is an attribute uh, of the element and so on. So th this is a kind of a, you know, an XML-ish version or view of the world. And, and, you know, that's how you go through the, the Yang Navigator. You can, you have certain types and uh, you can navigate through it. So yeah, the, the queries here might be, um, for instance, I want to see, I want to know that uh, of all the application entities uh, that have, and there's an application list beneath that, they all have endpoints. And I want to look only at the endpoints that have a port start greater than 7,000. And, and if there are more than eight of those, um, then the validation is true, right? So, so basically what this is saying is that you must have more than eight endpoints in your application um, that have a port start value of over 7,000. Now it's a ridiculous, uh, I mean, example. <coughs> um, you know, maybe that you could make that less than eight or something like this, you know, um, but uh, that's one example. Other things you can do is, um, for instance, uh, I want to see if there's in the whole tree, uh, how many VCSs have an SST that's the same as the, current SST of the VCS I'm in. Um, so basically there should only be one, which basically is a unique constraint. It's saying mm -hmm. like, I want the SST to be unique across all VCSs. Um, and, and so basically that most rule is defined on the, uh, on the VCS container. So dot SST means the SST of this VCS instance. Uh, so like, this is kind of how the expat works. There's another one here, for instance, like if you two attributes on a, on a, on a container, one was the uplink first size and the other was the downlink. So 
for this to evaluate to true, the uplink must be greater than or equal to the downlink. I mean, it doesn't mean anything in the real world, but it's just an example. Um, and and that would be defined on VCS, VCS slice MBR, you know, so you can, what it's doing is, it's, I'm trying to show that it, the, the expat is relative to the node or the, the Yang container that you have defined it on. So you can use dot like this, you can use dot dot to refer to its parent and dot 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 to its grandparent and so on like that. So that's the, that's the expat. And so that's something we want to bring in in the next while. And this will be something that will happen completely inside the model plugin and not inside honest config. So, you know, the model plugin, you'll still send your JSON over to us. The validate will run, it'll run the normal validation and then it'll run this extra validation from the expat point of view as well. So this is not something you have to worry about from the honest config refactoring is, kind of point of is view. Is there going to be a library that uh, like yeah. includes some of these? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because so, I see this happening in many model plugins. And yes, oh yeah, fun. absolutely, yeah, yeah. So for the moment, I have put it into the config models repo. There's like a top level Go module there and uh, and I'm, I'm putting it in there, but I mean, I'm open to change it to, um, that's where the model plugins are gonna go anyway. And the stuff that Thomas is doing is going to go into that config models location. Um, so yeah, the next steps to do on this basically is complete the implementation of the Yang node navigator and and then integrate this with the YGOS uh, compiler. And you know maybe maybe we'll keep it as a separate package that can be validated individually, or else maybe we'll feed it back upstream to the YGOS Go Yang guys. Um, you know and uh, and and. Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of work, of work uh, to do on it, yes, uh, to get those guardrails going, but that's something we'll be hopefully completing in the next quarter. And finally, the last uh, the last thing I had was um, uh, we we use leaf refs uh, a lot in the ether model, and um, uh, one constraint is that the leaf ref must refer to something within the current model. Um, you know, so uh, for instance, like um, when we have a leaf ref like in Ether, and uh, we're referring to, um, I don't know, say the device group here is referring to traffic class, for instance, um, they're all within the Ether 4.0 model, okay? But what if we were to think, um, you know, maybe there's kind of a an Ether, um, well, one thing we were trying, we were thinking of doing is maybe having a model only for site, um, you know, within Ether, and then having another model for common things like traffic class. Um, could we in some way extend leaf refs to refer to, um, items in different models. Um, and, and so that wouldn't fit into the normal YGOT validation. The normal YGOT validates couldn't handle that kind of thing. So potentially what we could do is we could add a layer of validation that goes, once you've, in, you, once you've done your validation for individual models, that you might have another layer of validation on top of it uh, that goes across models. And, you know, that's something that, that would give this kind of point. You are introducing a dependency between the two models. You are, yes, you are, so yeah. What's the advantage of having two separate models if they are dependent on each other? Uh, I suppose maintenance, really. I mean, uh, you might want to have a, you might want to break up. Well, one of the advantages is, uh, for instance, when you have a model and an instance of a model, like uh, at the moment, we have only one target for all of these configuration, right? Uh, so we were thinking about, let's have a target per enterprise. Um, and then Scott suggested, well, why don't we have a target uh, per site? Um, and it's the model really is the unit that's going to allow you have different targets per site. So say for instance, like um, uh, 
not everything is contained in sites. So applications are saved, are, are shared across sites. Um, traffic class is shared across sites. And what else will be shared across sites, Scott? I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Yeah, but the, those is, seems all the stuff that you can still put in the same package. You could put it in the same. Okay. Now, device group is, is a model, or maybe this is where my young knowledge is not up to par, but I don't see how that will be different from what they're showing there. Um, so what, what would be different is, yes, these are individual modules for each of these, but when they're combined into a model, it's all the one model. And so when you have an instance of a model, um, so say at the moment we have one ether instance of a model. And so that means we can have only one SD core adapter that we can push to, to for all of ether, regardless of the enterprise, regardless of who's a tenant. Okay. Oh. How the adapter matters with the model? Say again? How the adapter matters to... Uh, how is it, how is so the adapter... It seems to me that what I'm struggling to understand is the difference between the definition of the model and the instance of the right, model. Right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, I so, think we're mixing the two. Yeah, yeah, no. So, so you're right. You could have many instances of the model, right? One per enterprise. And that would be... That would be fine in Onus. So what you have is Onus Topo then would have one entry per enterprise and we would have one target per enterprise. And you're right, there would be many instances of that model then, right? But we wanted to take it another step further than that. We wanted to say, let's have a site because site is a nice uh, unit to have in Onus Topo because it relates to a physical location and you know Onus Topo is sort of a representation of the physical. Uh, and so that would need that would mean then that your model would need to be done on a per site basis. And yes, you could have many instances of site, and each one of those instances of site is related to a certain enterprise, and that's fine too, right? And I, I think the other way to think about it is, um, you know, if we think about the size of the configuration tree, you know, right now the configuration tree is for, for, um, for either production, the configuration tree has all enterprises in it. It's not even broken out as target per enterprise. So it's, it's in effect like one large configuration that the SD core adapter manages. Um, if you break it out per enterprise or per site, then you, you kind of have like a forest of trees and the adapter can manage each tree separately. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. So like taking, taking site. So if you have a model then of site, that's a fine thing in itself. And, you know, you have an instance for each site. But, so the, the part that maybe I'm missing is that when you define the model in the way you're showing now, you can only create via GNMI and Ether tree. You cannot create a specific subset of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I should have drawn a diagram of this uh, to, to make it clearer. Uh, maybe I should go to the whiteboard. Um, we, we can take this offline because I think this, this is something that I need to. Cover. Yeah, yeah, no, I will cover it. I will cover it one to one with you and, and uh, just to, to reason through it. But basically, what, what I'm getting at is that, say, if we go for a, a model uh, for the site, um, there are certain things that that model will have to refer to outside of site, things that are common across many sites. So, like application. If you have an enterprise, um, you know, they might have an application that's going to be used across many slices and even across many sites, you know, so it might be a common, I don't know, uh, accounting application or, you know, some auditing application or something like this uh, from, a, from an, an, uh, an ether perspective. 
And so what I'm thinking is trying to do leaf riffs across different models in Onus config really, it's not that big of a deal when you think about it. Uh, what you could do is in the Ether model, we use leaf refs extensively, right? So, and, and, and basically what they use is to refer to a library of objects. So you have a library of device groups and you make a leaf ref across to it, right? Um, and, and you have a library of sites and, and you know, when you're creating a VCS, you associate it with that site through a leaf ref. Um, but they cannot refer to instances in another Yang uh, model, right? And so really it's only at the point of validation that you're actually checking that your leaf refs work, right? They don't restrict you at any other time. And what you could do is you could have, you could introduce into your Yang a special notation for cross refs, you know? So um, you can extend the Yang language and you could come up with your own keywords that denoted this is a cross reference to something in another model. And, uh, and you could have a, a, a language for defining the model and the instance of the model and all of that kind of stuff. And then what you would do is you would have a special validator that would validate those cross references at a point in time when you had, after you'd validated all of the individual models and instances, you could come along then and, and do your special validation on cross references. <laughs> and at that point, um, you know, you would, uh, you would be able to validate that, in fact, this isn't breaking something. It's not referring to some, you know, application that has gone away or doesn't exist anymore or something like this, you know. So, so that's kind of where I'm getting with this. It's, it's probably not something that we'll cover in ETHER 2.0, and it's probably something that can be added on on top of Onus config to perform these cross references. It's not going to be in the model plugin per se, um, but it's something that can sit on top of Onus config at the validation stage that you validate your cross references. Um, to realize it and to take into this account this special notation, I think Goyang would have to be extended to handle this special notation because at the moment Goyang ignores every Yang custom definition type. It just ignores it and throws it away. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of what you'd have to do. And um, yeah, I think probably not in the, in the scope for Ether 2.0, uh, but uh, it is something that we would like to do long-term, I think, you know. So uh, that's all the slides I had. Uh, probably, just up at the end of the hour. Uh, if there was anyone had any questions? Yeah, I actually had a couple of slides on a compiler plugin. Oh, yes, hi Thomas. Hi, sorry, I joined the last few minutes late, but I heard everything. Um, so it was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Sean, for Good. doing that. I was uh, a little bit busy with uh, some other stuff. Yeah, I, I saw your misfortune. We won't get into it on the recorded call, but um which part did you want to cover so i have actually here i have uh, if you stop sharing i will um oh yeah oh yes 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 yeah about the plugins sorry yes uh so if, if everybody has at least a couple of minutes of time unless if, if people are short on time then i can certainly do that uh, later it's separately uh, let me uh, stay for me yeah, yeah it's good for me that's yeah. okay Let's just go through this very quickly. I really don't have that much. This is really just, uh, everybody can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So this can be just basically overview of the upcoming changes. Now, some of these have already been done and some of these are in progress and some have not been yet started, but this is just to kind of reveal the, the plans for treatment of the Onos config model plugins. So currently, <clears throat> The model plugins are, you know, used principally to validate the configurations and to get the schema so that we can get the type information. And um, Sean alluded to that a number of times um, because some of that uh, type information is not uh, sort of surmisable based on the external data by itself. Now, today, the, these are built as shared libraries. They're generally generated on the fly from Yang files and uh, Helm, uh, some um, Helm, uh, YAML fragments in Helm configurations. 
And then they're loaded as Go plugins by the Onos config. And uh, from where they're accessed using uh, just a regular Go interface uh, to be able to get the schema and to be able to do the validation. Now, because they're loaded as shared libraries and accessed from within the same process, they do require um, some you know, fairly high level of alignment uh, of the dependencies with Onos config. You know? So when they're being built, they, they need to be built with the same set of dependencies. Uh, and so this ends up being very, very brittle and it's fraught with many issues. And as, as Jordan alluded to in the past, there's a number of uh, Golang projects which kind of avoid the use of plugins as a plague. And so, um, so this is why we want to change the way we do the, uh, we, we treat model plugins and how we, how we use them. So the purpose remains the same for the new model plugins. Again, it's to principally validate the configuration and to be able to get the type schema. But instead, we would like to build them as separate executable programs, uh, which we can then you know, generate at build time. Again, the same, they would be built from pretty much the same type of information, which is the YANG files and a YAML information, except this time the YAML wouldn't come from uh, as, a, as a fragment from a from a Helm configuration, but rather it would be just laid on a disk uh, along with the Yang files. Now these separate programs uh, would be packaged as, um, as Docker images and then would be loaded as sidecar containers within the um, Onos config pod. <laughs> now, because they're separate processes, uh, clearly using a plain Go interface wouldn't suffice. So we would be using we will be using a gRPC interface. Uh, this has already been designed in Onos API. It's called Plugin Service, and it basically just obtains it has two calls: uh, one to obtain the model metadata, which does include the schema, and then um, um, a call to be able to validate a gRPC, um, um, basically validate a JSON uh, configuration and provide uh, basically a Boolean result, whether it's okay or not. Um, now, because it runs as a separate process, we no longer need to worry about aligning the uh, built, uh, you know, the package dependencies with Onos config. Um, and it also has a separate failure domain then. Um, so if there's an issues, it's not going to take the Onos uh, config down. So the, so the work started towards this goal uh, first on the model compiler. And so um, the, the, uh, the process for building the, um, but the model plugins has been changed a little bit. Uh, the, the code to do this is still hosted in Onos, uh, in a config models repository. Um, it's a compiler that basically just refactors some of the on the fly compilation and uh, instead to invoke it at build time. It's um, the model compiler itself is pre-built. It's published as a, a Docker uh, image on the hub. And it can be then at any given time run on a volume, you know, with the mountable volume on the directory, which has a Yang directory in it containing all the necessary Yang files and the metadata YAML file, which describes some of the modules and versioning information, which is not otherwise obtainable from the Yang files. Now, what this does produce in the same volume that was given, it produces a set of Go bindings via the YGO generate tool. It produces a model file using the Piang tree tool. Um, it currently doesn't do linting, but it will do linting, um, which is what Sean alluded to uh, using Piang link tool uh, to make sure that the Yang files are you know, coherent and well structured. It will also generate a, using templates, it generates a couple of other artifacts to be able to actually build the plugin. One of them is the main uh, program, which basically just uh, starts up gRPC server and implements the plugin with gRPC interface on there. And then it also generates a very small make file for being able to build that plugin and to also be able to build the Docker image. And also it generates a Docker file for assembling the model plugin. So basically you would run the command that that's shown at the bottom of a slide here. And this is just an example uh, to, you know, it takes like a few seconds and that's it. And then you can just run, you can CD into the directory and you can just run make and you have a Docker image. And you can then publish the Docker image for the, for the model uh, on Docker Hub as well. 
so it's fairly straightforward. Uh, what this does allow you to have, host your Yang files, basically your models, which is the Yang files and the metadata.yml anywhere you want. Uh, so they don't all have to be inside the config models repository. So in a, going forward, we'll probably host just a, just a device sim and some test models in the config models, just as examples, but all the other models like stratum and ether models will be hosted somewhere else completely. Uh, so this is just an example of the you know YAML files for the device sim and and a met, uh, metadata YAML file for the device sim. And it's very very simple YAML. It just talks about the um, you know the root modules and their revisions and where they came from. And this is all the input that's required to be able to compile the plugin. Um, Next, the work will, uh, and this has already started in, in uh, working on a new model registry. Um, the, because the model registry, because we changed the way the model plugins are loaded, we'll be changing the way we're, um, um, we'll be also discovering the plugins. Um, the idea is to scan a given list of ports to be able to discover the plugins uh, by, by basically attempting to connect using gRPC client and interrogate that uh, client uh, for metadata. And then um, if all of that works, then the register will basically consider the model plugin to be registered. And from then on, it can use the gRPC interface to validate uh, you know, target configurations as they're encountered. Um, on a related note, the Onos config plugin repo, uh, which is currently used to provide the model registry and also provide some of the dynamic compilation uh, capabilities will be will be deprecated because the functionality will have been some zoom between the config models and almost config itself. Um, also in use today is an operator which provides the compilation capabilities, the dynamic compilation capabilities, and that will be basically rewritten and repurposed. It will no longer need to do the dynamic model compilation. And instead, it will be redone so that it will become basically an emissions webhook um, for the Onos config, uh, specifically designed to work with Onos config pod. So it'll look for um, Onos config specific annotation uh, or annotations. And um, if from there, it will basically learn which mod module plugins should be loaded. Um, as, and they will be loaded as sidecars. So they'll basically be injected as sidecars to the Onos config pod with appropriate port information. So basically the port, uh, gRPC port numbers will be kind of assigned to each model plugin and then it will be given to two different places. They'll be given to each model plugin so that it knows where to start up on which uh, port to start up. And they'll also be given to Onos config as a list of ports that it should try to probe for Onos con um, for for config model plugins. Now, uh, this is just rough outline here. Uh, this is something that will probably be done as, uh, you know, maybe like a third or fourth stage of this of this work. So there will likely, you know, will be uh, else where we'll have to change stuff. Sorry, Thomas, what's the advantage of doing this via an operator instead of directly via the Helm chart? Since at this point, we don't have to build. Yeah, yeah, so, so we can certainly initially so I can, so initially, yes, we don't need the operator. We can just write globs of YAML to be able to load the sidecars and, and, uh, and, to, um, and to configure the ports for both the sidecar as well as the, as well as the Onos config. We can do that by hand. But the general idea here is that the information, this is really the root information that's required is really just a list of Docker images for the models. And from there, the globs of YAML can be auto-generated effectively. You, you can auto-generate them in Elm. You can, have an Elm template. you can have an Elm template that does that. You just pass the list of side effects you want to, to deploy. It, it seems a pretty straightforward case to deploy a bunch of containers from a list. Yeah, so maybe, um, possibly. Um, I was hoping that we would also be able to set up like liveness probes and all of those things. Like suppose you could do that from a template. Yep. Uh, maybe I'm just not all that vers well versed with templates uh, in Helm to do that. So we, we, I'm certainly open to, to doing that instead of the operator if that's 
if that's uh yeah, we should try that first i think and then if there's some reason that it doesn't work out then we can yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm all for doing, you know, if you don't need to have another moving part, that that, that would be better, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if we need it, we'll, we'll create it. Yeah. Yep, that sounds good. So I might I might need to talk to some uh, template experts. Uh. I, I, I can help on this, but I feel like I spent enough time banging my head on the full time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, be, to be sure, I was planning to, initially, the whole goal was to do it manually anyway, so might as well do it with the template. And that will actually reduce the amount of work of having to do it by hand. Yeah, and, and I think it would be, I, 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 I feel it would be, more kind of uh, robust and reliable as well because um yeah well yeah i know it's helm but like <laughs> at least it's explicitly stated you know i mean for the operator to run it um you know a crd has to be loaded or well it looks for the it looks for the annotation i think doesn't it in in the model plugin and and, and it's generating it out of that i i don't know i just feel that like some things with the operator for instance, with Onus Topo op operator, I think we've seen some things that don't clean up manually or, or clean up automatically, and you have to go in and manually clean them all. Well, it's, it's simply one less moving. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, right? But but I think with like the proxy, we have the app operator, which kind of does does this, and that's kind of what I pattern this approach based on. But I well, think template will do it uh, especially given the fact that this is specific to just one pod rather than exactly, just... yeah i think that's what makes it different from the app operator the app, app right. operator applies to every app that somebody might want to create and deploy exactly. so in that case i think that pattern is more useful but this is just applied to almost like yeah. broad specifically so the template is easier too yep yep so I, I, I like that that's a good idea so Anyway, so that that's that's just generally that that's it. This is our slide. Kind of goes at least a blazingly fast overview of some of the work in this uh, in this area on the boundary between the plugin and the config. Bruce, it'll be the uh, model plugins were fun, but uh, yeah, let's move on. I think <laughs> <laughs> robbing you of fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I found my new fun with X Pass Thomas. <laughs> okay, it's because okay. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be responsible for that. It's like uh, a long hike. The few first miles are fun and then it becomes a struggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, this is enough pain inflicted. All right. Well, that, that's all I had. So. Thanks, Sean, and thanks, Sean, for the presentation. Yeah. Bruce, thanks, everyone, for attending. I think we can close it out at that unless there's any more questions from those online. Sounds good. Great. Great. I think Scott had, had to drop before your presentation, but I'm sure he'll watch the recording. Great. I'll stop the recording. And